fortnight break for the Rugby Paper podcast, but in that time we have had two rounds of this year's Rugby Championship. Join myself and the whole squad of columnists today as we discuss Argentina's headline win against the All Blacks and things looking pretty bleak for the Wallabies a year out from a Lions tour. I have to say it feels like it's been a long, long time since we last recorded. Um, Tom Foley came on a couple of weeks ago. He was a fantastic, fantastic special guest. So if he is listening, a massive thank you to him again, um, as that was a real privilege to be a part of that episode, actually. Um, we're still fortnightly. Soon we will be back on the sort of weekly schedule. But while things are a little bit quieter, um, I'm giving the guys a break. They are here with me today, though. Um, it's just the four of us, myself, Brendan, Nick and Chewy, and... We've got two rounds of the Rugby Championship to review, so there's obviously lots to talk about. Um, and to be fair, it feels like a while since we've sort of delved into rugby happening at the moment. Obviously, with the Olympics, a little bit different to test rugby. So I think let's sort of take a um, a holistic view of the two weeks to begin with. Um, the headlines are, I suppose, New Zealand and Argentina. I think we'll get to that later. I want to start with Australia, um, only because there's obviously... British relevance, British and Irish relevance, sorry, with the Lions tour in 2025. Um, I was tempted to bring our good good friend David Campesi in, but I think that's probably say, better saved closer to the Lions tour when I'm sure his emotions will be boiling over even more. Um, zero from two, obviously two tough asks against the world championship, uh, world champion, sorry. Brendan, how are you feeling if you're an Australian right now? Uh, I wouldn't be in great shape. Um, I, I was a bit underwhelmed by the by the audition. And let me say, first of all, I've enjoyed the rugby championship so far. Sometimes it can pass you by, but there's been plenty to really tuck into, both New Zealand, uh, South Africa, Argentina. But Australia haven't come to the party yet. They seemed a bit powder puff up front. Um, they got beaten, in effect, by two South African teams. They got beaten in yeah. the first test, and then they got beaten by a mix and match 15 in the second test. Um, in the second test, it was very odd, you know, South, South Africa had their scrum sort of neutralised by the by the um, uh, uncontested scrums, and, but still used their power to get three line-out scrummage, uh, line-out more tries. You know, there's no stopping this, this mean machine. That, you know, it's been a good couple of weeks for the box. They're playing like world champions. But Australia just looked a bit lacking. And you know, they obviously are lacking a few of their European-based forwards. But I'm not even sure that that would be an instant fix. So I'm worried about Australian rugby. And if they come off the back of two defeats in Argentina, which is very possible, we're back almost to square one, I think. I think if we do get two defeats in Argentina, maybe we do call, call Campo. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for the probably the most expletive-filled podcast in the history of not just the Rugby Paper podcast, but all podcasts. Um Okay, you know, obviously the words Brendan said, they were kind of echoed this time last week everywhere after that first defeat to the Springboks where they didn't really throw a punch. Now, there's a little bit of conflict in that uh, they obviously were running the Springboks fairly close until 60 minutes in. Um, then obviously Malcolm Marks and Co kind of took it away from them, but it was a Springboks second team. So what's your take on some people taking positives? Campo himself described it as adding silver linings to mediocrity um, and sort of papering over not just cracks, but genuine issues. Well, I, I think that they've brought in, you know, if you look at Joe Schmidt's uh, track record, he's a good coach. You know, I mean, his record with Ireland was, uh, you know, I mean, he's criticised for being a method coach, but um, he's been a very successful method coach with Leinster and Ireland and uh, and before that as well at Claremont, where he was assistant coach and so on. So I think that they've got a good coach. I think that their biggest problem is, is that they um, if they got every player um, fit, they would be, or, or selected um, the likes of Skelton, they would be, their first team would hold up under scrutiny. The problem is, is that they've got no depth in multiple positions and particularly up front there's nobody you know there were household names in Australian rugby for a long time there are no household names now none at all um so the profile of the game I mean they've got they've, they've had pretty good crowds actually for both of those games okay it was the world champions coming to town and there are a lot of South Africans obviously 
the diaspora in Australia is pretty um, pretty large as well. But look, they they've got problems. There's no question about it. If you uh, if you start up front, which as we all know is where it starts, um, they've got two props who 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 are actually I think pretty good. Angus Bell is a very good uh, uh, prop. He's had foot surgery. He's just come back from it. I was really surprised that he was pulled off at half time in that game. I don't know why. Um, and I, 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 I really hope that nobody's playing silly buggers around, um, you know, front row substitutions. Um, I think that uh, they're, a, you know, they're very much a work in progress and the progress isn't going at the rate that they need it to. I mean, um, the, unless they really pick up, unless they find a, a, a you know, front row backup that's credible, um, they need to uncover. They've always had great back row forwards. I'm not really sure that they've got, I, I like Val Valentini, but I'm not sure that they've got e enough clout in that area. And they've got a real problem, I think. I think they've got decent scrum halves, but I think that um, Lolosia is not really cutting it at the moment. And I think that they do have a problem at, at, uh, at fly half. And Tom Line has been mentioned, and they didn't give him a run against South Africa. Um, sort of makes you wonder why in some ways, but I guess Lolosio was the man in, in, in possession and they gave him a run. So see what happens in Argentina. I thought Argentina were fantastic in the first test against New Zealand and bloody awful in the second. Um, so, you know, we, you know, to say that the, the, the Aussies will be, um, you know, uh, absolutely banjaxed when they go to uh, Argentina, I'm not sure. Depends on Argentina, really, in some ways. I mean, the selection, when you beat the All Blacks and you then, don't, you, you know, normally you'd usher in the same team for the, uh, you know, with maybe one change or whatever. I mean, Montoya, for me, is, you know, he's the Argentine captain. They brought him back in for that game. I thought he was poor in the game. And I think he was fairly poor for Leicester at times last season as well. He was a very, very good player. But at the moment, he doesn't look fit enough. And, um, you know, the, the idea to uh, drop one of the locks and put Kremer in, who's who's a terrific blindside, you know, to put him in at lock, it just it made, and drop the guy, the new guy that they brought in, who'd actually played very well against the All Blacks. And their best prop, Sklavi, is... Is a is a twenty minute bench man. Start the man. You know he does damage. Um, I just find the whole thing. I, and Kondopobi, you know, he's a fly half. He's you know he, he he was a very very good player. He's obviously a very bright bloke, but he really got selection wrong. I don't know who he was listening to. If anybody, maybe he was listening to himself. But it was a major major screw up. I think I think Ons Bomi will learn from that. To be fair, obviously he's <clears throat> fairly. Well, yeah. but, you know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many chances you get to learn yeah. of that of, of that magnitude. But you know, but not just the personnel, Nick. They, you know, they knew that at Eden Park there was going to be a backlash from the All Blacks, and they they were still on the bus for the first twenty minutes. There was yeah, no mental agreed. preparation, whoever they had on the part. They just weren't ready for it. No. Well, it was, you know, I mean, it was a classic, it, it, just a classic case. You're right. They weren't ready. The, psychologically, they weren't weren't really in it. And um, I, I just, you know, and, and I, you know, you said that you thought that, that I, I thought the first round was intriguing. I thought the second round, I actually thought both games were, were pretty poor. I think the quality, yeah, South Africa were more impressive in weekend one. Um, just to come back to Australia, Chewy, obviously what Nick's just been going over there is essentially no depth they obviously didn't have a front row you know there are sort of there's talk about the uncontested scrums being a semi-deliberate ploy etc we've seen a lack of attacking intent meanwhile South Africa fielding an A team and a B team or versions of that and beating Australia fairly convincingly twice one that's not really something we've seen from South Africa in the past 
four years. Obviously, I suspect they'll bring in the big guns um, for the two New Zealand tests, but we'll see about that. Um, but two, Chewy, is that sort of chalk and cheese pretty much summing up the sort of dichotomy of where those two great rugby nations are currently at? Well, I mean, Nick's analysis of the Australian situation is bang on. Um, but I, I think it goes deeper. Look, look my, my, my son's been living in Sydney for seven years. He's a big rugby nut. Um, and he's, he's just come back. Um, not because of how bad the Wallabies are. Um, he's come back for other reasons. Um, but he he confirms. He, a part. <laughs> he confirms. He confirms. Confirms what we all what we've all spoken about and read and heard um, down the years that the profile of the game, yeah, irrespective of the crowds and the, and the, the huge South African population, have something to do with that. I'm sure. Um, the enthusiasm for the game in Australia is going through the floor. It's going through the floor. Its profile is incredibly low. Um, it's become, I mean, it is so far behind Aussie rules and rugby league now in the, in the general sporting consciousness and indeed football, so far behind football as well, not to mention the great summer game. Um, it's got a real struggle and Nick's absolutely right. Um, there's not only is there no depth. I don't think. I don't think they've got. I don't think they've got a surface. Mm. I think they're struggling for a surface. I think they're so anonymous in comparison to. I mean, I, I know nostalgia and all that kind of thing. But the 1984 side was one of the seminal sides in in rugby history. Mm. The Markella Campesi side um, was it Liner was extraordinary. The The side that won the World Cup in 1999 was an outstanding team. They conceded one try all tournament. One try. Against the Yanks. Beat the Lions against the Yanks when they, were, when they were 50 points up. The side, the Wallabies that got in the final in 2015 was a terrific side, actually, playing well. Um, to the extent that England, for all their problems during that tournament, no one gave England at Twickenham a prayer of beating them in that in that third pool game. Not a prayer. Everyone had written England out of the tournament before that game took place. That's how good the Wallabies were. And actually, they pressed a, gr a genuinely great All Black side pretty hard in that final. That that was nine that was nine years ago by my maths, and they have gone absolutely down the plug hole. And I think it's a serious, serious concern for not just the Australians, but for world rugby. I mean, this is one of the foundation nations that still runs the game, still mm. runs the sport. They've got a massive voice. They just haven't got a team. Yeah. yeah. And and I, I, it concerns me that the rugby landscape is so narrow, and I blanted on about this last week. <laughs> we need to broaden and deepen the strength of international rugby. And we're seeing it diminish. Yeah. We are seeing it diminish. Argentina made a big step forward in that first test. I never really expected them to get back up there for the second test. I think that that would... Look, if they're going to be as good as they want to be, they're going to have to start getting back up and, and go back to back, of course. But those are quite big steps to take. Um uh, so Argentina, what, sixth in the world, Australia down in ninth, whatever it is. We've got ambitious rugby nations who have no fixture list. Yeah. Georgia, Portugal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I confidently expect Argentina to win at least one of, of, of the tests coming up against the Wallabies in the rugby championship. Yeah. And God knows what the All Blacks are doing. If the All, if the All Blacks have lost twice against South Africa, which is perfectly possible, because we'll talk about them in a minute. But if they lose twice against South Africa, they are going to have to smear the Wallabies all over the Pacific just to, just to buy Robertson a bit of a break from the criticism. So the Australians are on a really hard road and they don't have the players to get to the end of it. At the moment, they don't have them. They are not there. And I think that's a massive concern because the Australians always had a smattering of world-class players who on a good day, even on an average day, could beat most teams. 
Yeah. And they're not there at the moment. And I think it's of huge concern and really quite depressing. Obviously, I should say that we all hope to be proved wrong here. Um, we all hope to be proved wrong. I think our pessimism is obviously realism. I think most of us would feel and probably most listening would agree. Um, but from my point of view, Australia could quite easily end their first rugby championship winless. Um, and I'm sure you guys would agree with that. Mm. Just to check who was paying attention on uh, um, at the weekend. How many captains did Australia have over the course of the 80 minutes? Oh, Christ. Ooh. Is it four? It was four. Very good. I, I won't ask you to name them. Um, but the reason I sort of bring that up to kind of segue into it is if we love giving the the England cricket analogy. And there was there, there was a feeling when England had lost one in 17 tests that... One, there was change needed, but also, what you know, a slightly less extreme version of there not being the personnel to necessarily take England forward. And what England had was, one, a coach to inspire. And as Nick alluded to, Joe Schmidt is a good coach with a good track record. England also had a captain to inspire. Now, Australia, before the rugby championship, they'd had seven captains in the past year. I suspect now that Nick White and Harry Wilson were captaining at the weekend. I think that might have gone up to nine or 10, but sort of question to the floor that that is an issue, right? Obviously they picked Eddie Jones, picked Will Skelton, which was out there, of course, but almost made sense because it was so out there. Australian needs a talisman to take them forward, to instill a little bit of bit of belief, to add a little bit of a bit of identity, a little bit of culture. And well, I suppose question to the floor. Do you see that in any player in that Australian squad? Well, that one went back to Chris's point. You know, no totem pole players, and almost as a parallel for that, no obvious captain. You know, there's no obvious commanding figure on the park yeah. at the moment. I don't know. I mean, I, I I think that they've 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 got. I mean, I I don't understand their policy regarding Skelton. I don't understand it. He's a world class player. He was phenomenal at times um in the last well since the um since that 2015 Sar uh, Saracens European Champions Cup fi final win over Leinster Skelton was outstanding in that game he was outstanding in both of La Rochelle's wins over Leinster he is a you know by the account of the people his peers he is an extraordinary force on a rugby field. Now, he's not the usual sort of, he's not a Campisi um, or a Horan or whatever else. He's a forward. Uh, but he's a very, very um, good forward and could be could be a talismanic forward. Um, and I just don't understand. I don't understand how uh, Schmidt hasn't got him involved um, or whether it's, you know, problems with him getting um, released from, from La Rochelle. Um, but it, it just doesn't seem, it, it doesn't seem right to me. The bloke who, who could lock alongside him, uh, Frost, is a very, very good athlete as well. But he's a youngster. He's, a, or he's not, I'm not sure that he's, he's in his mid-20s, but he's, he's really new into the side. But they've definitely, Bell is a player who, if he gets fit and remains fit, is definitely another player who, who you could say was captaincy material. So I th I think that they've got captaincy material, particularly in the pack, and that's where they need to come, you know, to improve most. One of the things that I heard about Australia's problems is, is that their, their academy pathways were um, disrupted or, or dismantled at one stage. So, you know, that that's a very obvious indicator of why things aren't joined up in terms of, uh, of players coming through the pathway. In the under-20 championship, which is, I guess, the only yardstick we have of, of players coming through, um, they're usually middling, but they're not the worst. So I just, you know, I, I don't understand... Um, the decline that Chris talks about is it's absolutely right. You know, I mean, in 2001, John Eels is Wallabies, you know, uh, they were world, world champions at the time, like as the Springboks are now, they beat the British Lions. 
and they beat them. You know, it was a very good series, and they but they beat them, and and deservedly so. And for them to and you know, 2015, they reached the final under under Checker. You know, for their game to collapse in the way in which it has is a, uh, you know, we can talk about the failings of administration in the sport in numerous countries, England included. But in, Austra in, in, in Australian terms, it's gone down the plug hole. You know, and now they've got they've, they've got former sort of um, uh, high profile flanker like Phil War involved, Daniel Herbert involved, but they really need, I'm, I'm sure that they're doing everything that they can in order to, you know, to revamp things before the Lions tour. But they've got a hell of a job on their hands by the looks of things, because for the last decade, it seems like they've been sitting on their hands while the game has been losing profile, losing any sort of losing, definitely losing traction in schools. I think that that's one of the biggest things that's happened. Well, and one, of the, and one of the two biggest cities, one of the two biggest cities in the country, no longer has a team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mel Mel Melbourne's Melbourne is union free. Yeah. So you know, I mean, they've got massive their their, their administration, the ARU, and I see that you know Brett Robinson along with Jonathan Webb, who are both who have both been associated, I would say, with um, administrations in England and Australia that have not reacted as strongly as they should have done to what's going on in, 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 the, in the game in, in, in either country, are now both pitching for the, um, you know, for the uh, uh, chairmanship of, the, uh, of world rugby, which I find extraordinary. It's... A bleak outlook. Um, of, it, 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 it's, it's the anonymity that concerns me. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, I mean, unusual for Nick to bang on about the forwards. He's right to bang on about the forwards, but actually, you could, you can, you can work out half a competitive Wallaby pack if they're all fit. If if, Skel if Skelton plays, Angus Bell turns out to be as good as everyone hopes and and and, and thinks he should be. Fadatini is a good player. And he's doing a bit of a Michael Hooper at the moment because because he's playing he's playing a bit on his own at times. And I think Fraser McWright at his best has quite a lot of potential. So so there's there's half a pack, um, you know, uh, one in one in each row of the scrum plus a plus a second back row. That's okay. But where the Wallabies always used to be so brilliant. I mean, from nine to fifteen, in, in, inventive, um, ambitious. Uh, adventurous, all the, I mean, and actually sharp thinkers, moved, shift the envelope thinkers. You wouldn't say that Lenny Ikatow and Hunter Paisami are um, the Gittos and, and, and Liners and Ellers and what have you of our age, would you? I mean, so their midfield doesn't, doesn't really cut it at the moment. They've lost their most threatening wing to rugby league. Um, and and the, the the great sort of scrum half. I mean, they got they got they've got usable scrum halves, but you know they haven't got a George Gregan hanging around, or else he'd be playing. It's a it's a big problem, big problem for the game. And there's all sorts of issues over there. I mean, probably not the time to get into it, but if you're a young um, Pacific Island heritage lad living up in Brisbane now, an outstanding player, you've got options now. You don't just go think of Australia straight away. You know, you've got Fijian options. You've got Mona Pacific playing it as well. They haven't got a hold on some of that outstanding sort of Pacific Island talent quite like they had 15, 20 years ago. No, no. Obviously, the elephant in the room that I alluded to earlier that we haven't spoken about yet is the Lions are, what, they're a year out. And we, we've always spoken about how this tour has to be a good one from the British Lions perspective. Um, I suppose it's a double-edged sword, really, and that it has to be a good one from an Australian perspective. Now, the last tour down under, or the last, yeah, it was cracking. Obviously, we all remember 2013 phenomenally well. Australians will have very fond memories of 2001. Um, the memories of the Rugby World Cup run in 2015 are obviously dissipating. This is a big tour for us after the non-event back in 2021, but it's a it's an it's just as big if not a bigger tool for them and we met you know we may get accused of arrogance here but at the moment it's a no contest you feel the best british and irish lion side against the best australian side tomorrow 
And you'd have to think it would be every bit as dominant as that first South Africa win. Does anyone disagree with that before I sort of nail my colours to the mast? Not, not no. at all. I mean, it, it doesn't whet your appetite at all at this present time, unless you're a Lions diehard. And there are tens of thousands. It will be a very support, very well-supported tour in terms of Brits and Irish going down. But as a rugby spectacle at the moment, uh, it's not getting my poles beating. No, it, 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 ticks, it ticks all the boxes for the Lions supporters, apart from their rugby, which is a <laughs> bit of a problem. I think we can all agree. I mean, I mean, Australia has always always been an attractive tour for the Lions, or in recent in recent decades since since the standalone Australian tours came in, it's always been attractive because you don't have the security hassles and 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 the restraints that are still in place to a degree around South Africa, um, and it doesn't hose down the rain all the time as, as it does in New Zealand. So every everything's there for the for, for the Lions supporter in Australia, apart from a half decent Wallaby side. You do want some decent games of rugby, a hundred percent. And obviously, I mean, I'm saying this as a Lions supporter. No Lions supporter wants to win a series three 0 you know, by twenty thirty points in almost every test. There's nothing. I mean, I suppose if you were to do that against the World Championships, maybe that would be quite nice. Um, but no, what you know. 2013 was so good because it went to the wire. We weren't necessarily expecting it to. It did. Um, obviously, and I actually, have... that wasn't the greatest of all Wallaby sides either. No, they, exactly. I mean, so so they did did sort of get themselves up for that um, um, uh, for at least the first two games. I mean, the, the first test was very well. The first two tests were very close, weren't they? Well, exactly. I mean, they were a curtly bill slip from winning the series. But it, it, it you know, what that wasn't a vintage Wallaby side in the sense that. The O one side was slightly in slightly in decline, I, I I suppose, after the World Cup, but still a bit, you know, full of big, big names. Sure. And actually, that Wallaby side in 2013 had some had some star quality. They still had the big names, yeah. They I still mean, it had Falau, it had Beal, it had, you know, I mean, I mean, it had your Hoopers and George Smiths and what have you. But uh the, the, this lot uh, um, they're 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 insignificant in comparison. Yeah. Yeah. The one, I, I guess the, the one thing that they, you know, the one advantage that they they could have is that if he does um, manage to get enough players of test quality uh, or test potential, then there is the opportunity for uh, in a country like Australia to for them to get together in such a way as they might become a club side almost in terms of preparation and so on under Schmidt. And that's probably what they're going to need with maybe one or two trans Tasman infusions <laughs> as well, <laughs> because, you know, if they could, if they could cherry pick a, a couple of um, promising New Zealanders who might have Australian heritage or be born in Australia, because there is obviously quite a lot of that uh, that has happened historically, then, you know, they're, they're, but it, it it does seem to be clutching at straws to a degree. Look, the Lions are always um, at, a, at a disadvantage because they are effectively a scratch side. And I did uh, a con piece last week where I looked at Ireland in particular and the number of players that they've got hovering between 30 and 35 is quite significant. So what happens this season is going to be extremely important um, in terms of Lions selection, because we're assuming that there will be a very much a, a, an emerald green spine to the team. Um, I was intrigued to see Finn Russell saying how much he would enjoy playing in the side as Owen Farrell, uh, Lions side as Owen Farrell this week. And I was, I was thinking about it. I was thinking, OK, well, that means that um, either, uh, you know, that Farrell will be back at inside centre. Now, he did a good job for the Lions in 2017. There's no doubt about that. He did. His kicking was was exceptional. And defensively, he, he also did a good job. But the idea of a Lions back line of a 10-12 combination, given the sort of centre talent that there is out there, of, you know, Russell and Farrell doesn't float my boat. Agreed with all of that. Um, 
in the interest of time, guys, I think we should probably talk about another nation. Um, let's sort of migrate over to South Africa a little bit. I know we've obviously touched upon them. Um, they seem to have added a dimension and it's probably, I mean, obviously there's big change since the Rugby World Cup. Um, Rassi's back in his 2019 role. They've got it's effectively an entirely new backroom staff. There is obviously that backbone that is still there, but, and this is a sort of question to the floor, this is a different spring box with a different level of depth. And obviously they continue to look to add to that attacking noose that they developed just before Rugby World Cup 2023, whilst also staying faithful. Um, what do you make of that sort of summary? Well, they were definitely much more attack-minded and um, in the first test, uh, three or four times they were running it out from you know behind their own post, not behind their own post, but deep in their own 22. They were exploring the attacking options first. And they look at altogether more, I mean, it's ridiculous to say they're the world champions, but altogether more dangerous side. They had more more weapons, um, you know, and they won that match comfortably. Uh, they could have won it by 40, 50 points. Uh, and then they've all, always got that rugby now some adaptability to go back to plan A as they did in the second test with their A stroke B15, where basically in the last 20 minutes, they just stuck it up the jumper. Um, and, you know, to, and it was more difficult playing conditions, of course. It was a bit wet and slippery. So, you know, I, I, I've been so impressed with them. They, they're, they're playing like world champions now because, you know, there's this sort of estimation that they're not necessarily the best team in the world. You know, they, they can't really beat Ireland um, for a start, which is not good. Um but actually, they they are now playing like world champions. They're, they're a team you can really admire all the facets of their game. It's, 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 it's in that, in number in ten that, position. Didn't that series in uh, South Africa finish one each? Well, it did. But I mean, <laughs> four of the last six matches, Ireland. And I think, and, and I think Ireland actually, actually that clinched first. it with a drop goal in the in the four last. Of the last six and I can see the comment section seven. already coming. Uh, they, 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 they all they all count. The, the Lions did the same thing in '97, mm. <laughs> exactly. and, and actually, what what sort of what sort of the gander is sort of the goose? The Springboks have won hell of a lot with their kicking game, um, up to and including the age of Pollard. What fascinates me about the approach at the moment is that they got a run in ten. Mm. When yeah. did South Africa ever have a run in ten? Ever a running ten? A running who's ten. Who's don't, say from but, don't say Butch James. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or indeed, Joel Stransky. I, I, mean, I mean, hey, a genuine hey, running ten, and they've got three or four. They had a running ten in Libok in the in the, oh, in oh, the, oh, the yeah. last World Cup. Yeah, I mean, know, yeah so. but that's that's very that's very recent, Nick. I mean, I mean this yeah. this shift, I think, towards if if you're going to play a more expansive game, a kind of wood or the adventurous game or high risk game or coast to coast game, whatever rubbish term you want to apply to it. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of descriptions that used to drive Brian Ashton out the wall. Um, but it depends on having a 10 who is prepared to unleash and enable his outside backs. And the South Africans haven't always had that. In fact, virtually throughout their history, as far as I'm aware, they tended to have a kick first 10. I mean, you've had your honey balls and your Butch Jameses who were scarcely tense at all. They were like flankers <laughs> playing in the number 10 shirt who happen to have big boots. Hmm. Um, but now they've got three or four, including Libok, this new guy who, who I won't pronounce, pretend to Slash, pronounce I just call him. because I don't like to humiliate myself um, live in front of a vast audience. Um, but the, they, the, uh, you have Valencia as well. So so there are, there are three or four genuine running freestyle tens, if you like, who are bringing a new dimension to the South African attacking game. And, of course, at the back end of the World Cup, when Libok didn't completely convince, and unsurprisingly, Pollard comes back for the games that mattered and wins wins the stuff with his kicking. Mm -hmm. um, and the mindset switch is that they've got to accept, if they take this new approach, that occasionally it unravels a bit. And, you know, indeed, indeed. they unraveled a bit in the first half on Saturday and they just had to tighten up a bit. But... um you know they're, they're they're going for it. They're trying for it, and they look a much more complete team to me. Uh, I think that they've got. I mean, the 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 uh, the young fullback that they've got, Fassi, looks electric. Yeah. Um, and 
you know the centers that they've that, that they've got I mean Am is just coming back from from injuries he, he's knocking on 30 now I think uh, but you know they've got some terrific players and they've got some terrific players coming through there's no question about that and I, I think he's probably got three pretty good 15s at the moment yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and 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 all the, the the sort of wings and it depends where you want to play Kane and Moody when he's fit again yeah. This guy Arense looks fabulous. I mean, how good is Chesney Colbert? Yeah. I mean, I mean why wouldn't I mean, you play a, better, two, a more open game if you got those players? I mean, those two wingers. You know, I mean, everybody t talks about the South Africa's always producing big bangers. You know, they're ex they're the exact Opposite. antithesis of that. They're fantastic. Um, both of them, both fantastic players, and I think that Moody is another gem. You know. He, he's not yeah. had as much game time because I think he's been injured, but he's he's another terrific prospect. So. I mean, I mean, fair fair play to the box, the the, the spring box side that, that that won the World Cup last year. Um, they were very very difficult to stop, but you knew you knew in that tournament what what you were trying to stop. I mean, once you had Pollard, the Allende, Creel, there weren't many massive surprises coming out of out of that lot with. With what they're trying to do with 10 now, they are adding an element of genuine sort of mystery and intrigue, which you don't really associate with the most successful South African sides. And I think it's exciting. I'm not criticizing them for a second. I think it's genuinely exciting. And I hope it I hope it works for them because it's compelling stuff. Uh, I mean, with that new approach, Chris, suddenly you realize what a good attacking player Jesse Creel is, as well as oh, a unit. Well, transform. And and did you, in fact, I don't know if anybody clocked it, but on the first test match, when they were doing the jersey swaps at the end, Evan Etzebeth wouldn't swap it with an Aussie. He wanted to swap it with Jesse Creel. He wanted yeah. to give him his shirt and his acknowledgement of yeah. he thought was an outstanding performance. Well, from Etzebeth has all bad ideas above his station. <laughs> <laughs> Say that I mean, to his face, Chewy. I mean, for, for me, the fantastic thing about them is, is that while world rugby is spinning and weaving as you know as destructively as it can regarding uh, the set piece and particularly the scrum trying to marginalize it razi erasmus has taken the scrum and made it his command module and i i think that they are a fantastic um advertisement really for the 15 aside game because they're showing that there are multiple ways to win and they're showing real uh, excellence in one of those areas where world rugby has got its its head up its nether regions. Which is where, where your heads tend to be when you come up against a springbok front, front row, funnily <laughs> enough. <laughs> Unless it's uncontested scrums, then you survive. <laughs> so Australia yeah. seems to have got that correct. Um who starts at 10 then for New Zealand tests? Are we expect? I mean, I, that is actually quite a big call. And what's been interesting about South Africa is we, I sort of feared that talking about them after their Rugby World Cup win in between now and the next World Cup cycle would be a bit of a sort of moot point because obviously they work in those cycles. But there does still seem to be an edge. Obviously, Rassi got very up for that um, series against Ireland. Same here. So I, I think there will be that for the tests against the All Blacks. Do we then think that Rassi's treating that as a World Cup final, in which case you still pick Pollard, or do you think you go with, I'm going to try, Ngoma Zulu? I Sasha. would second guess Erasmus ever. He's he's um, he's an interesting character. I mean, I know I know he's I know he's taken a few liberties here and there, but crikey, he is he's he's become a giant, hasn't he? Yeah. He's an absolute noticed, by the way, five minutes in on Saturday. Um, who was the ref? Had to chuck off one of the the, the bot water carriers who'd come on after five minutes with some messages. I mean, nothing changes much there. But no, um, no he, is, he is a major coaching figure, isn't he, Rassi? I mean, he, I don't want to disrespect others, but he coached that last. You know, he's been he's never stopped being the coach, in my opinion. He is the box no. coach and has been since he took over. No. Nothing happened in South Africa that he didn't want happening, and he wasn't part of. Absolutely, and 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 you know, I I don't have a problem with the with with the water for instructions and all that kind of thing. I think rugby has bigger, big, seriously bigger problems <laughs> to worry about than getting a few. So you can always get some instructions on, can't you? 
I mean, I see old old Renee, the physio. She's still on the touchline, hollering and shouting, and and joining very, in the scrum sometimes. Very, very, very close to events. Although, I mean, she could get them all she, off um, the touchline. Get them all off the touchline. Yeah. Don't want to see any of them, buggers. <laughs> Um, just look, guys, we've probably got about 10 minutes left, if that. Um, we've obviously got probably the four most interesting fixtures of the rugby championship in the next couple of rounds. We've got a week off this weekend. Um, probably the hardest to call as well. I think everyone's predictions would have been more or less right, barring Argentina beating the All Blacks in round one. Um, let's talk about the All Blacks a little bit. Um, it was another case of chalk and cheese, as it was with Argentina. Um, a lot of people are reporting quite positively around it most of those people are outside of New Zealand um but really the All Blacks have cut the gap on the Springboks at the top of the world rankings so Chewy is this well what do you make of it right what rather than the sort of the neutral take on it what do you make of it I about New Zealand yeah um I, I, I in, in fact well I, I I want to get my head around this for the for a some rubbish on the weekend anyway, but it, it strikes me that unusually for New Zealand, I mean, there, there have been moments, 98 was a classic example, just before a World Cup, where a hell of a lot of outstanding All Blacks, Michael Jones, Sean Fitzpatrick, Frank Bunce, Walter Little, Olo Brown, Zinzan, all went pretty much simultaneously. And it left New Zealand. And John Hart was the coach at the time. And he was, he was a pretty damn good coach, Harty. I mean, there weren't many sharper rugby minds than his. But they didn't know what... They, 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 they were in a position where they didn't know what their best side was. They, I mean, there was a fair bit of chopping and changing. And this reminds me, even though Scott Robertson has got a much longer lead into the next World Cup, and he'll want to put his own stamp on the side. But... Apart from the Barretts and Will Jordan, who's just come back, and one or two others, I would think more than half of the all-black positional, the all-black positions are up for sort of grabs. No one has a clear idea. Who's the best nine? Is Mackenzie definitely the long-term 10? What's your best centre partnership? Who's what? Who are your best wings? I mean, Will Jordan is almost certainly one, but who's the other one? Um, there's a there's going to be a decision to make it loose head. There are big weaknesses, or not weaknesses, but but a, a, a lack of authority in the second row. This is unusual for New Zealand. This is unusual. There there is a there's a lot of blank space around selection, which has to be filled in. Now they have time to do it, but you lose two against South Africa. And then you're playing the Wallabies, who you're going to be expected to be. And then you've got tests in London, because we can't call it Twickenham anymore, in Paris and in Dublin. Not necessarily in that order, but that's a tough old road in the autumn. And you could suddenly have the All Blacks losing quite a few, uh, losing unusually often, let's say, for the rest of this year. And I think it's fascinating. Um, they'll build a side out of it. They always do. And they'll be good come the next World Cup. Of course they will. However, and that's that's uh, that's Claire who's just burnt the bacon. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's my thoughts on it. I just think they are unusually fragile. Unusually. I, think, I, I think what you've outlined there is the potential for, like you say, a calendar year where towards the back end from now or from the Argentina test, I suppose you'd say, because I think the general public will be relatively happy with the two tests against England. You have a lot of defeats in not many more matches. Um, do we think with New Ze with the New Zealand public, obviously notoriously cutthroat with head coaches, captains, etc. Do you think there's such thing as a desensitization effect? I.e. Argentina have now beaten New Zealand three times in four years, for example. That may not carry the same weight now as it did around defeat number one. Um, say France do it again for the, I don't know, what would it be, the third time or second time that I could think of. Or South Africa do it, you know, having done it in the World Cup final. Brendan, do you think there is such thing where an, 
a New Zealand public. I don't think defeat system. ever sits very well with New Zealand rugby or New Zealand rugby fans. I mean, um, I don't think there's ever a, a case of they get used to being beaten occasionally by Argentina and and France. Um, and I, quite I, often by Ireland. <laughs> oh, <laughs> again, I rest my case, my lad. Yeah. Um, they're a very perplexing team to get your head around at the moment, New Zealand, because even, even on Saturday, they were pretty poor in the second half. Mm-hmm. When actually Argentina finally got their act together a little bit, but still didn't play brilliantly, uh, they were bang average after half time. They, they were just very good for 40 minutes. And in fact, you could argue that's been about it this summer. You know, England, looking back, England, golden opportunity to win that series 2 0. I mean, they really should have hammered that one home. So they're, they're nowhere near where they should be, but it's New Zealand that they, they will learn. They've got a front row, so that is a start when they go to South Africa. They, they, they might hang on a bit longer than most, the front row. Uh, and that'll bring them together, you know, it's a proper good little mini-series, that. And I think New Zealand touring parties will respond quite well. They'll be travelling over, you know, get a full week's preparation, two tests to get into. I think that's going to be quite an epic little mini-series. I still think South Africa will probably win both tests, but they might both be crackers. And then, and then that's it. Like Chris was outlining, they have to score a, you know, a lot of points against Australia, put them away in style, at least steady the ship. So it's it's a really interesting first season for Scott Roberts, and I'm not quite sure how it's going to go at the moment. Hmm. Guys, I want to finish by if we call these two. Hang on, I've got something to say on New Zealand, Holly. Go, go I, next. Go. Yeah, look, I, I think that. Um, They've got two key players who are playing in Japan at the moment, Mwanga and Frizzell. And I would expect to see them rehabilitated at some stage. I don't think that Robertson, by what you the mood music is, is that he's not totally sold on Mackenzie, I don't think. <laughs> and um, I think he is still sold on Mwanga because he was the bloke who landed him God knows how many uh, Super Rugby titles. Or he, he, he wanted him back earlier in the year. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So there's there's a play to be made around that. Um, the inclusion of Tamati Williams at loosehead against Argentina was huge because they destroyed Argentina's scrum as comprehensively as uh, South Africa did Australia's in the first test. So I, um, I, I th- and Williams, incidentally, I mean, he, he started in the World Cup final against South Africa. And that um, scrummaging battle was notable for the fact that there were no resets in the game at all. And it was a monumental scrummaging battle, which was basically a stalemate. So... Uh, Williams is a huge man and very, very, uh, you know, he's a very, very good technical loose head as well. Um, so with him and Lomax, I think that they'll they'll go well, probably uh, in, in South Africa. But this would be the one series against the Springboks that I suspect that New Zealand would not want to go to South Africa. They'd want to be on their own turf. Um <laughs> But I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that it's um, it's obviously because the swing rocks are at home, you've got to fancy them and and on a roll. Uh, but I don't think New Zealand will go, uh, you know, quietly into the night. Well, let's what I what I was going to say is let's label these two consecutive weekends of fixtures as two mini series. Um, and in true rugby podcast style, I'd love to get your guys predictions around that. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go South Africa, New Zealand, and then all I'm going to ask is an aggregate score. Um, Kano, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> an aggregate score. So by that I mean I don't mean over the course of the test. I mean one test all or two nil New Zealand. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Okay. Um, one apiece. One apiece. In what order? Um, Springboks win the first. Okay, and then All Blacks bounce back. Brent. Uh, two nil box. Two nil box. I'm going two nil box. Chewy. Two nil box. Okay. All right. Kano's the outlier. Um, I look forward to Kano's smug face in three weeks' time. Or otherwise. <laughs> or or our smug, <laughs> or our slightly less smug faces. Uh, and then 
Argentina, Australia, this one might be a little bit more divisive. Chewy, we'll go in reverse order. Um, two nil Pumas. Oh, big. Brendan. Yeah, two nil Pumas. Nick. One apiece. <laughs> There's only so much fence in the world you can sit on, Cam. <laughs> no, no, no. I say it's a pretty sharp fence, mate. <laughs> yours I'll... is the soft. Yours is the bloody. Yours is the plank. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll back you on that, Nick. As well, I'm going to go one apiece as well. I think Australia to win the second test. Um, out of the two, that it, it'll be an interesting couple of weekends. Um, obviously. I'll probably talk to you men next. We've got Stuart Lancaster coming on in a couple of weeks. Um, so we can massively look forward to that. And at home, you can look forward to weekly episodes again from then on. Um, so these guys get a break from me or rather I get a break from them for next week, as do you. And then we'll see you in a couple of weeks time. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday and to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe to our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day.